Good afternoon. My name is Chris Bositis, um, and with me is Amy Bositis, and we are very happy that you have joined us for our session on co-located co HIV and addiction care uh, on a mobile health unit for homeless people living with HIV and substance use disorder. This is our disclosure slide. Our objectives for this afternoon's session uh, are first of all, to describe three components to low barrier integrated HIV and, and substance use disorder care in a mobile setting. Secondly, uh, we hope that you'll be able to identify three key staffing roles that are needed uh, in order to provide integrated HIV and addiction care in a mobile setting. Third, we want to describe two patient experiences uh, for individuals accessing HIV and addiction treatment in, our, in this setting. And lastly, uh, we hope that at the end of this, you'll be able to describe how low barrier mobile integrated care has impacted engagement and viral suppression uh, in this population for our community. At this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Amy, who's gonna talk a little bit about the background uh, in our community and then describe the intervention that we came up with to address the problem that we were facing. So I'm gonna stop sharing and let Amy share now. Great, thank you for joining us. So I do wanna tell you a little bit about how this intervention started. Um, this was not something that we just came up with, um, but it was a response to what we believe our community needed. And so I wanna start with explaining to you where we are. We are um, in Lawrence, Massachusetts, which is a um, old mill city, city located um, in the Northern region of Massachusetts. We are very close to New Hampshire and about 30 miles North of Boston. We are historically a, an immigrant city. We have welcomed immigrants um, since the beginning of Lawrence, Lawrence's history. And currently we are predominantly a Latinx community with people identifying as Dominican or Puerto Rican. As with many old industrial cities, um, we experience some of the, um, some of the hard issues that have, that have happened um, given uh, post-industrialization. So many of our people live in poverty um, and struggle with some of the, the health outcomes that, that come from poverty. Um, but Lawrence is not just a struggling city. Um, it is also a city of great uh, energy and passion. And for those of you who know your history, the Bread and Roses strike of 1912 happened in Lawrence, which helped end child labor and also gave us our weekends. So Lawrence is a, um, a vibrant city um, that also struggles um, with some um, with some issues. The, the health center that we work for is called Greater Lawrence Family Health Center and it's about 30 years old um, and was established to help treat people um, who identified as immigrants um, who were using the emergency department for their primary care. It has grown to be one of the largest employers in the city with over 600 employees. Um, we have multiple sites. Um, we also work in schools and have from the very beginning worked to address um, the health needs of people who are homeless. Um, it is a family medicine um, model, and we also have some special programs, such as our HIV and viral hepatitis program, addiction medicine for, for many years, um, and behavioral health. The health center also is home to the Lawrence Family Medicine Residency Program, which was the nation's first health center-based residency program. So what happened? Well, in, the, in the summer of 2016, we noticed that we had five people who were newly diagnosed with HIV in a very short period of time. Um, all of them had homelessness and injection drug use as risk factors for HIV. Um, and this was a significant change from our previous numbers of new infections. Um, so we immediately alerted the Department of Public Health um, to what we were observing. Um, and over time, the Department of Public Health was very responsive and um, it really helped us try to understand what was going on. Um, a few short months later, they approved us to become a syringe service program um, at our health center and we were able to start addressing some of the, um, the needs of people who were injecting drugs. Um, 
as you can see from this slide, our numbers continue to rise. Um, and again, in 2017, we, we alerted the Department of Public Health that, our, that we were continuing to experience in, to experiencing um, a large number of people who were newly diagnosed with HIV and who had injection drug use and homelessness um, as risk factors. At this point, the Department of Public Health reached out to the CDC um, and we uh, were able to have the CDC come and do uh, an epi aid to, to look into what was going on. And the, the outbreak at that point was not just in Lawrence, it had also spread to a nearby town of Lowell. Um, so what CDC was able to identify was that in fact, there were about 129 people who had been diagnosed between the um, years of 2015 and 18 who met the, the case definition criteria. And as we were seeing, the transmission risk was predominantly injection drug use, um, and about 90% also had lab evidence of, of hepatitis C. Um, and I believe 100% of these people also had identified homelessness um, within the last year. A couple of the um, kind of uh, the, the points that were identified um, through the interviews that the epi aid were able to conduct um, was that um, as we had been experiencing and, and we're seeing in our talk screens and in talking to our patients, the drug supply had changed probably about in 2014, 2015 to fentanyl. Um, and I'm sure many other people around the country are experiencing the same thing, that heroin is not as easily accessible. It's not what people are using, um, but fentanyl has replaced it, which as you know, has a different pattern of use. Um, the high tends to be a little bit higher and, um, and, and you tend to lose your high a little bit quicker. And so people are injecting um, many more times a day. Um, it is also um, an easier drug to make. Um, and we believe that Lawrence may be a manufacturing hub for fentanyl. And so many people are coming to Lawrence to, to purchase fentanyl. As you would expect, there was also some sexual risk for HIV. Um, and through interviews, over half of the women and a quarter of the men reported um, a history of exchanging sex um, for drugs or for money in the prior year. And also that people um, often had a primary partner with whom they did not use condoms um, and with whom they often shared syringes because they trusted them. Um, and as I said previously, 100% of our um, people in this outbreak also identified homelessness um, as a risk factor. So um, from, the, from the very beginning, our Ryan White program engaged intensely in, engage, um, in trying to engage and treat um, people who were newly diagnosed. We started um, treating people the day we met them. We start, so fast starts with ART um, and outreach, um, but we felt like we weren't um, sufficiently addressing um, the needs or able to engage everybody. So bef before July of 2018, we had identified there were about 29 people um, who were newly diagnosed with HIV, um, who had untreated substance use um, and had housing instability. And before July, we had engaged about 38% of them in care. Um, 12 of them, we were able to treat with AR ARVs and we had a viral suppression rate of about 28%. So not great. A lot of work was put into those numbers, but we didn't think that was um, what our patients needed. And some of the reasons for this is that um, obviously when you are homeless, you are often transient. Um, we had a large congregation of uh, people who were homeless living under a bridge for a number of years. Um, and about this time, about July, um, some police um, practices changed and um, our, our homeless individuals were um, scattered. And so we actually um, kind of lost touch with them. And as we have said before, many people have substance use and we have a very robust substance use program at our health center, um, but it's not always accessible for people who are homeless and who don't feel comfortable coming into a clinic. Amy, do you want to mention briefly uh, why if there were 129 individuals identified uh, through the CDC epi aid, uh, we have uh, only 29 uh, as our uh, number identified sure. in Lawrence there. Yeah, so as I said earlier, um, the, the epi aid actually covered two cities, Lawrence and Lowell. Um, and we had one, one portion of that, um, but the epi aid also found people in other communities. 
um, not just Lawrence and Lowell, but those, these were the two primary cities where um, the outbreak took place. So what did we do about this? Um, we took a somewhat of a comprehensive um, approach to, to an intervention. And we're gonna talk today about one specific intervention, um, which is our mobile HIV and substance use care. And I wanna be clear when I say mobile, um, we have this lovely mobile health unit um, that we uh, procured in about 2015, 2016. Um, it has two exam rooms in it, one on each end. It has a bathroom. Um, and as you can see, there's sort of a, a hallway or a waiting room in the middle where we're able to do phlebotomy um, and the staff are able to, to do a fair amount of um, linkages to care and, and referrals and things. Um, but it is not necessarily um, the most mobile of all units. It is large. Um, it, is, it is more like a, uh, an apartment building. Um, so we have to pick carefully where we, where we park our unit. Um, we don't, we are not a, we're not like an ice cream truck. We don't drive through the city and looking for places, but um, we are able to go to places where um, there is not a, a health clinic um, and in places where people feel comfortable coming. So the intervention that, that we tried and are continuing to try is by providing substance use care for people who do not feel comfortable coming to a health clinic. Um, but who need to access a mobile unit for their care, as well as integrated um, HIV care. Um, and so through multiple different funding avenues, we were able to um, get staffing and, um, and all of the other interventions that you need in order to, to put this into place. Um, but I wanna briefly talk about how this is one of our interventions. And so this is sort of a, a very messy Venn diagram. Um, and the health center chose to put opiate use disorder as sort of the driving force um, or sort of the, the driving need that affected all of these other components. Um, as we talked about, there's an HIV outbreak um, and, and most people who were newly diagnosed with HIV also had viral hepatitis, which we knew we needed to, to attend to and treat. There was clearly behavioral health needs. Um, these patients were in general seeking acute care in the emergency department. Um, as well as some chronic care needs in the, um, in the, in the hospital for skin infections and, and other infections that come with injection drug use. Um, as we said, many of them were homeless and many of them were incarcerated. So we started to um, integrate all of these programs into one program or under one leadership. Um, frequently, infectious disease is separate from behavioral health, which is separate from substance use treatment. Um, but we actually believe that they are all very related. And so we, we integrated them first under um, sort of one leadership, um, as well as enhancing all of the programs that we have within here. So I'm not gonna talk about everything, um, but I do want you to know that this intervention falls within sort of a myriad of other interventions. Um, what I am gonna talk about is how we integrated programs, personnel, and patient care to deliver um, substance use and HIV care to our most vulnerable um, patients. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is programming. Um, for the clinicians in the room, this may not be as interesting to you. Um, for those of us who are program managers and deal with budgets, um, this was actually a, a pretty, um, I think, um, innovative way to change the way we were um, providing services so that, so that our patients could get what they needed. So all of our special population grants were brought under one leadership. Um, which meant that our programming was integrated. So this included Ryan White funding. This included, included all of our prevention funding from the Department of Public Health, which was our SSP, our Narcan, our HIV and, and STI testing, our linkage to care and our correctional um, programs. It also meant that our addiction program um, came under the same um, leadership structure. Um, and, and lastly, that our homeless program came into this. So, um, a very large and, and diverse number of um, funding streams were brought together. Doesn't mean that we blended the funding streams, it just means that we brought the, the programming together. Another really important part of that is that our programs and our patients were reviewed in, com in, in combined um, team meetings. And this has made, um, this has probably been one of the most important interventions that we have done. Um, so 
we regularly, on a weekly and, and also on a monthly basis, um, review high-risk patients who frequently are homeless or using the emergency department, uh, have substance use, or have another infectious disease. And maybe I should have started with this, is that we have, um, all of these programs have adopted um, a, a common vision. And I think this vision changed um, in part because of the HIV outbreak in our community, which is that our aim is to provide as low barrier care as possible um, so that our patients don't have to jump through hoops to get what they need, that we were gonna do the jumping for them. Um, we also adopted a harm reduction approach to um, addiction treatment um, that we wanted to integrate our care. We wanted our patients to come to one place to get everything they possibly could. Um, and that included substance use and infectious disease um, needs. Personnel. Um, I want to start talking. So we, we in the health center generally operate with um, sort of three cadres of, of personnel. And this is particularly true in all of our grant world. Um, and the first group of individuals who I believe are the glue to this program are our community health workers. Many of them are trained as medical assistants, um, but they really view their role as being the, um, the first point of contact for individuals. So they are, they are our outreach workers walking the streets, picking up syringes, distributing syringes, um, helping people with insurance. Um, our driver of the mobile health unit is perhaps one of our, our most key community health worker. Um, and so they are, they are the people who bring patients to the unit. They are known by our, by our patients. Um, they are the ones that our patients trust. Um, and it is sort of through, um, that is the, uh, the relationship that helps bring patients onto the unit, I believe. The second cadre of staff are nurses. Um, and we, chose to cross train all of our nurses in HIV, viral hepatitis and substance use um, so that they could provide um, medication teaching, they could provide um, all of the grant intakes depend, regardless of which, um, which disease somebody had, they could, they could provide all of the, sort of the grant work that was needed. Um, and they are also a key relationship. Um, frequently, if, if a clinician is not on the mobile health unit or available, the community health worker will bring the patient to the nurse and the nurse has a very strong relationship with the clinicians and can get a prescription for the patient immediately. Um, and then finally, we have our clinicians. Um, and as I said, we are a family medicine um, program. So we have two family practice, three family practice physicians and one adult nurse practitioner who, um, who work on the mobile health unit. Um, and we have chosen to keep this number somewhat small because we believe that um, kind of the key to treating substance use and HIV is building trust. And so we wanted to have um, the same clinicians over and over again so they could build that relationship. Um, all of them are X wavered to prescribe buprenorphine. And, um, and one of our physicians, Chris, is um, an HIV specialist and also trained in treating viral hepatitis. So these were the, the staff. This is the staff that we use. Um, they frequently mix and match with each other, but um, I think this provides a, a really strong base of support for our patients. Now I want to talk a little bit about um, our model of patient care. And as I said earlier, we adopted a, a, a vision and that was that we were going to bring care to our patients. We thought by being in the community, we were available to our patients, but we realized um, that there's a lot of stigma with substance use and there's a lot of stigma with HIV and not everybody feels comfortable coming into a brick and mortar clinic, waiting in a waiting room with children, um, being judged for the way they look or they smell. Um, and so we wanted to get rid of all of those barriers. Um, and so we were gonna bring care to our patients. For a few months, we were parking our mobile health unit at the bridge and providing care during the evening hours um, when, when our patients were coming and going. Um, and we continue to look for new places that we can park our van um, so that patients don't have to walk and so they can come easily. We also um, wanted to provide densely layered care or services, meaning one-stop shop. If you came for your buprenorphine, we wanted you to be also able to get your PrEP or your HIV treatment um, or help with your insurance or somebody to look at your, your, your wound. Um, we didn't want anybody referred anywhere if at all possible. We wanted to provide everything um, and as quickly as possible for, for the patients. Our addiction team also began to shift because of the HIV outbreak to more of a harm reduction model. Um, our office-based 
treatment program, um, as many others in the state and, and in the country, began um, very, very strict with a lot of rules. Um, patients were discharged um, if if, they, if their talk screens were, were positive for illicit substances. Um, but we began to realize that uh, fentanyl was, was a different experience for people and our patients were really struggling. Um, and one of our goals was to prevent overdose deaths um, and to engage people in care so that at any point in time, if they were able to engage with us, we were going to, to treat their substance use. Um, and um, in addition to sort of the densely layered care and services, we really wanted to make sure that we were counseling every patient on overdose prevention, on HIV prevention or treatment, um, and on infection prevention, such as syringes and um, proper injection technique. And one of the things that we found is that the best place for us to park our mobile health unit was actually in the parking lot of our SSP. So that um, this was a safe place for people who inject drugs. Um, and they were able to procure their harm reduction materials as well as see, a, see the team and see a clinician for, um, for buprenorphine. As all programs go, um, what you start off um, thinking you're going to provide may not be exactly what you provide at the end. So I want to talk about some of the adaptations and challenges we experienced. Um, and sometimes it comes down to the, the nitty gritty. Um, printing a prescription for buprenorphine um, on the mobile health unit for the first few months was really complicated um, and was a barrier. It was just slowing things down. Um, and thankfully the health center was able to, um, to obtain e-prescribing um, access. And so our clinicians can e-prescribe controlled substances, um, which just makes, makes the flow much faster. Getting medications to patients. So we started out um, doing all of our buprenorphine inductions on the van um, as an observed induction. So a patient would come to us in mild withdrawal um, and we would monitor them and then you know, give them uh, two milligrams of buprenorphine, watch them for half an hour, give them another two, and then send them home. Um, the health center and the mobile health unit began to, to recognize that this was really uncomfortable for our patients. Um, and people were not starting because they could not come in withdrawal. And so we transitioned. Um, if it was safe to home inductions. The majority of our patients have already tried buprenorphine um, and they also know what withdrawal feels like. And so we gave them instructions on how to start buprenorphine in the comfort of their, their own uh, living situation. Um, we have tried multiple locations with where to park our van. Um, we want it to be easily accessible accessible to the individuals we are serving. Um, and this is possible for us because Lawrence is small, um, and we didn't, the city was very happy to have us um, move our unit around. Um, but the places that we have found most successful are at our SSP or very nearby at a, at a local day shelter. Another thing that we have found as we are thinking about densely layered services is that we need to actually expand our service, uh, our services to treating viral hepatitis. And because we have a trained physician who can do it, um, and the Department of Public Health funded us to purchase a mobile fiber scan, we are now um, providing viral hepatitis treatment on the unit. So um, what is the magic in our mobile health unit? Um, I think there's a couple, three main things that I want to point out that I think makes it work for us. First of all is that we have found an ideal location, and that is at our SSP or near our SSP. Um, and I think there's a couple things there that's magical. First of all, during COVID, I think we have really realized it is the community health workers who know patients and who bring them to the mobile health unit um, that has made it successful. And during COVID, we didn't have all of those community health workers doing it. And so the numbers of people seeking treatment on the unit were, um, were less. So it's the staff and it's also the location so that um, uh, individuals who, who need syringes and, and Narcan are able to access those as well as treatment. Um, the second thing is that our providers and our team need to be available for any and all of the needs of our, of our individuals. And so we try to densely layer um, as many possible treatment options as we, as we can. So primary care, um, we actually had a hepatitis A outbreak during this. And so we really ramped up our our ability to deliver vaccines. Obviously, we're providing buprenorphine, um, HIV and viral hep treatment, PrEP, treating skin infections, and doing all of the, um, the insurance help that, that our, our patients need. 
Um, the third piece of magic, I think, is have we co-located our one part of our HIV case management team, which is a community health worker and a nurse, to our SSP so that they so that individuals who are coming into the SSP can have on-demand help. Um, and this means when somebody is released from prison or um, and shows up at the SSP for help for syringes, um, there is a case manager there who's able to immediately activate their insurance. Um, and the nurse can oftentimes talk with the clinician and, and get them started on ARVs that day. So now I'm going to turn it back to Chris, who's going to talk through um, sort of some of the experiences we have with, um, with patients and kind of flesh out what this looks like for us. You're still muted, Chris. All right, I need to share my screen again. Sorry, is that mine? All right, and I'm gonna quickly jump down. Sorry about this. All right, so what I'd like to do at this point is um, talk a little bit about the patient experiences and outcomes uh, that we have seen uh, through delivery of integrated care in a mobile setting. Um, and just as a, a brief disclaimer, uh, we pick these patients not because uh, they are um, uh, earth shattering in any way, not because they had amazing turnarounds, but rather because I think they typify um, many of the clinical experiences that we see on the mobile health unit. Uh, in terms of their overall course. Um, so, um, yeah, and I think, I think it, it makes it real uh, so that we can all understand what, um, uh, what to expect uh, when delivering care to, uh, to this population in this, kind of, in this environment. So the first patient I'm going to uh, discuss is a 43-year-old male uh, with severe substance use disorder, chronic homelessness, and HIV. Um, he, his substance use disorder history is really complicated uh, and involved, but primarily uh, he, um, his main uh, SUD is uh, to opiates, uh, which he injects, uh, although he also struggles with use of other substances. Um, and prior to the, uh, his engagement on the mobile health unit um, in July of 2018, um, he was uh, experiencing several uh, overdoses. Uh, he had uh, frequent non-fatal overdoses uh, that were in fact so frequent that he became somewhat legendary among our uh, community health workers uh, in our SSP program, um, which is really kind of unfortunate. Um, he has a very complicated medical history, as you can see here, um, which uh, you know, added to the complexity uh, of his management, but um, he, he did show up, he was one of the first patients to show up on the mobile health unit seeking care uh, for his substance use disorder. Uh, and we started him on buprenorphine uh, at that time. Um, over the last couple of years, uh, since he's been uh, a patient on the mobile health unit, um, he's, he has stopped and restarted his treatment uh, multiple times. Sometimes it's because he um, has uh, been, uh, he, he's been incarcerated. Sometimes it's because he has chosen to go into uh, detox for a short period of time, um, and other times we're not sure why he why he's uh, why he disengages. But um, he almost always reengages. Um, another point I want to highlight is that um, as we've been caring for his um, for his substance use disorder, uh, that um, you know it's, it's apparent that he continues to struggle uh, with. Uh, with substance use, in spite of the fact that uh, we are providing treatment for um, for his illness, and uh, most of his most of his toxicology screens uh, have come back positive uh, for illicit substances, uh, including fentanyl. Um, although most of them also come back positive for buprenorphine, um, so uh, clearly he is um, you know he is doing the best he can. Uh, and I think the the real reason that I uh, wanted to to uh, talk about him as, as an example uh, is uh, because I think that this intervention has had really two important um, benefits for him. There have been two main successes. One is that um, during the period of 2018 to 2019, um, he had zero overdoses. 
uh, after uh, going the previous two to three years with multiple, multiple. Um, and so that was a huge, a huge difference, a huge improvement uh, that we can celebrate. And I, the other, um, the other big um, success that we can celebrate is that he has remained virologically suppressed um, throughout this entire time. Um, he remains, he, he remains engaged in care. Uh, I just reviewed his chart the other day. Uh, mostly this is through telehealth. We're going to talk a little bit about how we're providing care during the COVID era um, toward the end of the presentation, um, but he is still engaged in care. The second patient that I wanted to talk about uh, is a young woman who was diagnosed with HIV as part of this outbreak that we experienced in Northeast Massachusetts. She was tested uh, went, uh, through our SSP program at our community-based site, um, and uh, her test came back positive in August of 2017. Our case management team made multiple really heroic efforts of trying to engage her in care over the next two years, um, uh, but they were uh, ultimately unsuccessful uh, until um, September of 2019. Uh, during that time, uh, before she became engaged in care, um, she had at least one documented uh, overdose. But um, finally, in, in, in September 2019, uh, again, through the efforts of our, of our outreach team, uh, she did eventually come into care. Um, and um, when, she, when she showed up, um, she was very interested in treating her HIV, and I, I think this is largely because of the, the ongoing education uh, that she was receiving and counseling that she was receiving from our case management team, um, but she was not interested in treatment for her um, opioid-induced disorder. Um, it's not entirely clear why she wasn't interested initially. Uh, some of it may have been related to a relationship that she was in um, that was felt to be somewhat controlling and borderline uh, abusive. Uh, at least that's what the, the case management team was telling me. Um, but again, at the beginning, she wasn't super interested in treatment for her, uh, for her OUD. Having said that, uh, after um, a few visits uh, on the van uh, where we were talking about her HIV care and, and providing care for that, um, she eventually did decide to start treatment with buprenorphine. Um, and since then, she's been on again, off again. Um, but... Um, she has uh, on the bre in, in terms of her OUD treatment, uh, but um, again, celebrating celebrating successes here, uh, she has remained virologically suppressed uh, since she started on treatment, and so I think that that is a, that is a huge thing to celebrate. Um, her last visit that we have reported uh, was in March of this year, prior to COVID, uh, and we're hoping that we're going to be able to reengage her in care as we get back out into the community. Uh, and the last person that I wanted to talk about uh, is a, uh, actually is an individual who is not HIV infected, uh, but who has hepatitis C in, in addition to his uh, opioid use disorder. Um, he first came to the mobile health unit in May of 2019, uh, at which time he was couch surfing at his mother's. Um, he also reported a very long history of substance use disorder that started when he was um, still uh, in his teens. Um, he, all, he did um, have a history of previous treatment for his substance use disorder and it, that uh, he had long periods of recovery both with methadone and buprenorphine. Um, and his most recently in 2017, 2018, he had been in uh, the brick and mortar based um, treatment program at one of our uh, fixed sites uh, in the community. Uh, and he was doing well on buprenorphine uh, until he ended up going to jail. When in jail, he had a, an interruption in his treatment for his opioid use disorder. And so when he was released, um, shortly thereafter, he started using again, uh, experienced um, uh, a couple of non-fatal overdoses, uh, and so uh, came back into care through the mobile health unit. Um, when he came back into care, um, he we talked a lot about uh, not just uh, his opioid use disorder, but his risk for um, other uh, infections, including HIV. Um, and he decided that because of that, he wanted to start pre-exposure prophylaxis. We did rapid starts of both his buprenorphine and his pre-exposure uh, prophylaxis at that first visit. Um, 
And uh, over the next few months, uh, as with the previous two patients that we've discussed, um, his course, I think, would best be described as having fits and starts uh, with both his treatment for his OUD and his pre-exposure prophylaxis. Uh, he actually stopped his pre-exposure prophylaxis for a short period of time, uh, ended up sharing uh, injection-related equipment uh, with a partner. Uh, so we put him on post-exposure prophylaxis uh, at, before transitioning him back to pre-exposure prophylaxis. Um, but uh, four to five months in, uh, in October of 2019, um, by that point, we had actually seen a, a, a real transition. He was going to the gym, exercising regularly. He was in counseling. Um, and his opioid use disorder had really stabilized. Um, he was, uh, he had for two consecutive months, uh, talk screens that showed buprenorphine only. Uh, as a result of the, his stability at that point, he decided that he wanted to come off his pre-exposure prophylaxis, which seemed appropriate, and he wanted to start treatment for his hepatitis C, uh, which we did in November. Um, during the treatment for his hepatitis C, he started having um, significant uh, gastrointestinal symptoms, uh, which he felt were likely due uh, to the hepatitis C treatment. Um, he didn't stop it. He didn't stop his hepatitis C treatment, but um, it did lead to uh, a slip up in his recovery at that point. Um, uh, and um, so he was struggling with, with substance use while he was on his treatment for his hepatitis C, but he stuck with his treatment for his hepatitis C um, and finished in January uh, on time. He um, remains engaged in care uh, for his opioid use disorder uh, via telehealth. Um, and uh, we don't yet know uh, if he has been cured of his hepatitis C because we haven't been doing uh, labs for uh, our patients because of COVID, but uh, we are working on getting those done and hopefully we'll have them um, available soon uh, and we'll be able to know whether or not he was actually cured. Um, so those are three individual uh, patient scenarios that I think um, typify uh, the, the types of uh, encounters that we are seeing on a regular basis uh, on the mobile health unit. But now I want to step back and give, again, uh, more of a bird's eye view uh, to assess, is this, is this really working? Um, is this intervention of mobile integrated care really working, particularly uh, when it comes to the, um, some of the, the key outcomes that we look at for our HIV-infected population? Um, as a reminder, uh, we had identified 29 individuals with, um, who were HIV infected, had comorbid substance use disorder and housing instability before um, uh, July of 2018, before we started the mobile health unit, uh, only 38% of whom were engaged in care. Um, through the mobile health unit, we have been able to engage an additional 12 HIV infected positive patients. Um, and uh, as a result, um, we now have 81% of uh, our patients in this population who are engaged in care. Um, I also wanna highlight that uh, of those individuals who are receiving care on the mobile health unit, all of them have been prescribed ART. Um, most of them were virologically suppressed the last time uh, their viral load was checked. Um, and um, most of them have started treatment uh, for their opioid use disorder with buprenorphine. Um, those that haven't started treatment with, with us um, uh, for their opioid use disorder have either been linked to or continued on uh, care with methadone maintenance uh, at one of our lo local methadone treatment programs. So I think overall, um, we, we feel like this has been a successful intervention. Um, having said that, uh, we also recognize um, that there is still work to be done. We had hoped to enroll at least 20 patients uh, with comorbid HIV and substance use disorder um, uh, through this program, uh, and we fell short of that. Um, and you know, I think that there uh, are multiple potential explanations for this. Um, we don't know uh, 
which or how many of these are uh, at play in the lives of our individual patients that are not seeking care. But um, we have some thoughts that uh, it could be that even the low barrier care that we're providing in the community is still too high of a barrier uh, for some of our patients who really feel isolated and stigmatized uh, because of the layered stigma of having both uh, HIV, substance use disorder, and uh, homelessness on top of that. We also recognize that um, many of the individuals that we're serving in the community um, have uh, different priorities in terms of which needs they need to be addressed on any given day uh, and that this hierarchy of needs may, um, may make it so that they cannot uh, uh, reasonably be expected to come into care uh, at that point in time in their lives uh, because they need to take care of other things that are more important. Um, and lastly, we also recognize um, that uh, for some of our patients, um, they, they just might not yet be ready uh, for treatment for either their substance use disorder or their HIV uh, for whatever reason that might be. Um, from a more, um, so that, that's from the patient perspective. From the program slash staff perspective, there, are, there also are challenges, um, I think, that, uh, have, um, that we've had to deal with. Uh, one of the biggest is staff buy-in. And um, I will, again, echo what Amy said before, that we have an amazing team of, um, of community health workers and outreach outreach workers uh, working in our community. That said, what they do is very hard. Um, and I think they, um, uh, it's not surprising that they, um, given what they see on a day-to-day -day basis, um, they feel the tension between the desire uh, for the patients, the people that they're interacting with to enter into full recovery uh, and the harm reduction model that we're trying to implement here more palpably um, than I, as a clinician uh, who's only seen these patients maybe once a week or once every other week, might feel it. Um, and I think that tension uh, between the desire for recovery and uh, harm reduction um, can lead to frustration um, and burnout. And so we really are working with our staff to, to try to help them deal with that tension in a healthy way. Um, we also recognize that many of our, uh, many of the individuals that we're serving on the mobile health unit have really complicated uh, behavioral health problems. Um, problems that uh, cannot be simply addressed by the basic psychopharmacology that, um, that I and the other clinicians who are on the van feel comfortable, uh, feel comfortable with. And so uh, that has been uh, a real issue. And then, um, last but not least, COVID kind of blew things up uh, uh, over, the, over the spring. And um, I'm going to talk very briefly about um, our, what we did during COVID, um, but that has really been a, a, major, a major challenge uh, to the, success, the ongoing success uh, of this intervention in our community. Um, briefly, again, when COVID started, um, we really we moved from uh, in-person visits to telehealth visits for everybody, including the patients that we were seeing on the van. Uh, we were trying to provide people with longer prescriptions as much as possible, uh, even for those who were clearly, had clearly been struggling prior to the, uh, the COVID epidemic. Um, we are slowly transitioning back to a mix of telehealth and in-person visits, although we are still not quite at the, pers at the level that we were uh, before COVID, we, right now we just have one, one clinician who is seeing uh, patients on the mobile health unit and um, it's still not on the unit itself. She's, she's, seeing, she's seeing them outside um, to try to, um, as part of the infection prevention um, control plan. Um, and I think that um, as a result, uh, fewer patients right now are accessing the, the mobile health unit. Um, we hope to shift, make a shift uh, over the next few months um, but right now we've definitely seen a decline in the number of people who are accessing uh, our mobile health unit. Um, as I mentioned, we are hoping to resume uh, our pre-COVID schedule. Uh, we're hoping to do this in September. Um, and uh, other 
key next steps that we think will help um, improve uh, the, uh, the likelihood of success uh, in this population, um, however you want to define success, uh, would, it includes um, anticipated uh, surface expansion in the areas of integrative medicine, so wellness, uh, providing wellness clinics for, for patients on the mobile health unit, um, expanded behavioral health services through the, um, uh, we're hiring a licensed social worker to come and provide counseling on the van, um, and we also are likely to, or hoping to start uh, treatment for patients with latent TB infection uh, as well on the van. Um, and then um, importantly, we are also uh, planning on improving or, ex uh, or increasing the amount of um, input that we get from uh, the, the drug using community in terms of um, our programming so that we know um, more clearly from their perspective what would be most helpful for them and let, we want that to inform uh, the changes that we make over time. So to summarize, um, we believe that uh, this low barrier mobile uh, integrated care model uh, for our homeless um, population has uh, significantly improved care. Um, we think that some of the key components of success or for success um, uh, include, uh, first of all, making sure that we are meeting patients where they're at. Um, that means a lot of different things, but I think mostly um, what it means is trying to identify and address all of the varied needs that uh, individuals have when they come at each um, point of contact uh, when we see them on, on the van. Uh, in order to do that, uh, we have needed to set up systems that enable care integration, uh, for example, by cross-training our support staff uh, and ensuring that the clinicians that are taking care of the patients on the van uh, are comfortable uh, providing the densely layered clinical care that these patients often uh, require. Uh, in order to provide this cross-training and uh, in order for us to ha have the programmatic fle flexibility and adaptability um, that we've needed uh, to respond to the needs of our patients, uh, we, we have um, relied on diverse funding streams uh, in order to, to make that happen. And so that has been key as well. Um, I think the patient stories that we shared reflect both the challenges uh, and the successes that we can celebrate uh, as we care for this marginalized population uh, in our community. Um, and in the big picture from an HIV perspective, as I mentioned, uh, I do think that it had a significantly positive impact uh, on engagement, um, ART prescription, uh, and virologic suppression, uh, as well as on linkage uh, to and treatment for um, the substance use disorder from which our patients were, uh, were, were struggling. We'd like to close by acknowledging um, some of the other key team mem members that have made all of this work possible. Sandra Silva, um, who is um, the Associate VP for um, clin uh, Clinical Services and Outreach uh, in our, at our clinic. Ryan Dono, who's the Medical Director for Healthcare for the Homeless, Ilmo De Costa, and the SSP team, uh, our HIV Ryan White Case Management team. Uh, and the funding and technical support that we have received uh, from Ryan White's E2I program. And now we'd like to open it up for questions. Thank you very much.